Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, uh, it's very uh, good to be in the city today. I've been having some uh, great tours around to uh, uh, see the city and I've had a really good time here. And uh, uh, but apologies for being a bit late, but the traffic uh, held us up. But uh, now we're here, so I'm looking forward to telling you about my city, uh, New London Architecture, which I'm the curator in chief for, is uh, an architecture centre. We focus on development in London, uh, how London is changing, but also how its past uh, impacts on the future. And uh, I, I, I was having uh, dinner the other night with Dr. Sumer and uh, I, I pointed to a, a, a classical Greek building and I said, look, that's traditional architecture. She said, no, that's not traditional architecture. And uh, so our, our, our expectations and definitions about uh, what is uh, traditional, what is older, what is newer, are uh, uh, very interesting and vary from culture to culture because um, we're, we're an ancient and a modern city. And to a certain extent for us, it's very modern for us to have a Muslim mayor. So uh, clearly that's quite normal here. But for us, that's a, a really uh, good example to us that London is a very diverse and open city. And, uh, uh, but we also have a Lord Mayor. This is a Lord Mayor. And uh, the Lord Mayor deals with one small part of London, but he's uh, been... Uh, or his office has been in existence for nearly a thousand years. But our modern mayor, uh, we had an elected mayor and that was created uh, only in the year 2000. So just 22 years ago now, have we had an elected mayor. And uh, the elected mayor's role is to have uh, and to write uh, the London plan, really, which is uh, what is going to happen to the city over the next uh, 30 years. And so uh, I'd say the modern mayor is the one who really takes a strategic view on how we create change in the city. And London is uh, basically a historic city, and I'll explain now how we try to keep the modern city changing to meet changing needs, but also respecting the buildings and the environment of the past. So uh, just for a uh, quick introduction, uh, lesson in geography, London is uh, down here and it's uh, on the River Thames. And uh, as I go through my story, the River Thames is a very important part of how the city uh, was created and how it changed over time. And uh, this area here is called the Greater London Area. And that's the area that uh, the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, has control over. And then in the middle of that, which is just, just about here, is this area, which is called uh, 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 the City of London. And the City of London is the historic part London uh, as a whole is the wider Greater London area. So it's quite confusing in terms of names, but uh, those are, are quite distinct because uh, this is the really historic part of London. And th that uh, was first settled um, about uh, 2000 years ago uh, by the Romans. The Romans conquered uh, uh, England and they settled here uh, with a city like this, uh, with a, a, a forum here and an amphitheater there, and a bridge, which again is, is important because that bridge was put there because it was the easiest place for them to cross the river at the time. Uh, but it established where London uh, would be built in the future. And uh, London, uh, is still surrounded by the Roman walls, not in very good condition, but uh, these are parts of the walls that you can still see. And uh, the walls help to can contain uh, the city of London uh, within the area of what we call, we call it the square mile, uh, because it is a, a, a walkable part of the city. Uh, and so it is contained by 
at this ancient infrastructure. And then for the next uh, 1500 years or so, uh, London started to uh, grow and because of the river, it became a trading city. It traded with uh, the rest of Europe, it traded uh, uh, with uh, the Baltic states, uh, Sweden, Scandinavia, and it became a busy, uh, and then later on, obviously a global center. So the river, as I said before, is very important in terms of how the city developed. And uh, this area was uh, an important port with wharves all along uh, the uh, north side of the river. And also with streets, still very much like the Roman streets. The, uh, these, these streets were ones which were originally carved out by the Romans and they remained there uh, in uh, this image, which is around uh, uh, 600 years ago. And uh, one of the aspects of it was that uh, the streets were narrow and all the buildings were of timber. Now, one of the things about London is that it has been destroyed a number of times and then rebuilt. So it has many different layers of history beneath it. Um, the, the, the only city I've seen which has quite such a complex layering is, is Beirut, um, where uh, there are so many different parts of the city and you can look down into uh, Roman ruins as well as uh, uh, 14th century uh, ruins and of course those of today as well, very tragically. And uh, so we have uh, many of those sorts of changes happening in London. And that impacts on development because often when developers are digging into the ground to build foundations for new buildings, they will find archeological uh, uh, pieces which have to be rescued and, and uh, put into museums. So uh, this is the city that you would experience in about the uh, early uh, 16th century as I say, narrow streets, uh, timber houses, and a very busy uh, and successful port. But everything changed in uh, the year 1666 by our calendar, uh, when uh, the city of London uh, was uh, burnt to the ground, literally about 80% of all the buildings were uh, destroyed. And uh, this gave a chance for the city to be rebuilt. Now, of course, uh, planners and architects, actually, uh, the sort of destruction that happens in fires like this can provide opportunities. And certainly the most important architect at the time in London was a, a man called Sir Christopher Wren. And he was the designer of St. Paul's Cathedral, which is there today. But he was the advisor to the king and he wanted to change all those narrow uh, and uh, unhealthy streets for a modern city like this, a modern city that would look more like Berlin or Paris or Rome or even Moscow. Big wide streets and vistas and uh, places where uh, you could uh, have views from uh, big squares, uh, here, squares and vistas right up to another square here. And uh, so this was a, a very different sort of city than the uh, city that had been burnt down. But the city that had been burnt down uh, had, uh, was full of merchants. As I say, it was a busy and successful port. And the merchants didn't want to wait while a new master plan was created. Uh, they always take time. And so the merchants insisted that actually they built their buildings back on the same plans as they did before. And this is, this is a map that um, shows uh, it, how it was built after the fire, very dense, very narrow streets, but also some of the original streets. And this street, uh, which today is called Bishopsgate, Bishopsgate, has remained in exactly the same place since the Romans were there after the fire remained there. So um, when you look at the city today, it still has the same ground plan as it did in the uh, uh, 
uh, about five or six hundred years ago. And so it grew after the fire, and as I say, was rebuilt with many of the uh, buildings uh, on the same sites as they had bef before. But uh, this is the Cathedral of St. Paul. St. Paul's Cathedral is a key landmark in London today, and that is very important when we get to talking about new development, the location of uh, St. Paul's, and this view indeed, is very important. So remember, remember this image, and uh, we'll discuss it later. But uh, uh, you can see here relatively low buildings throughout, uh, punctuated by uh, the spires of churches. And uh, here in front of us again is the River Thames, as I say, a very important part of the development of the city. And then in the 19th century, as the British Empire grew, uh, London became the center of uh, global center of trade, and the buildings uh, became a, a little bit taller, uh, bigger buildings, but still the Dome of St. Paul's was a very important part of the uh, view of the city. And the walls uh, which surrounded the city of London were, this is at one of the gateways called Temple Bar. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, was then taken down in the 19th century because the traffic was uh, too uh, busy to uh, squeeze through it. Uh, so uh, the constraints around the city uh, then uh, were taken, taken away and it increased um, in the um, sort of late 19th century, uh, the city of London was actually the largest uh, city in the world and it grew up until uh, the 1930s into a city of about uh, eight uh, and a half million people. But then there was another a disaster which had an impact on the development of the city and that was during uh, World War II when uh, the uh, German uh, air force, the Luftwaffe, um, bombed uh, the area and uh, flattened uh, many of the buildings uh, around it. Uh, but most of the bombing in this area was were fire bombs and uh, there were a lot of people would spend their nights during the uh, bombing raids up on the roof of St. Paul's to put out the fires and that's why it was protected. But again, uh, this, this image of uh, St. Paul's standing above all the rest of the buildings, particularly the destroyed buildings like that, is a very iconic uh, image for uh, Londoners uh, and, and English people generally, and it is a key part of our understanding of the city. And uh, you'll see the importance of that uh, later in my talk. And then following uh, the bombing in the 1950s and 60s, the area was redeveloped. And this is a development which is called the Barbican, and it's a brutalist concrete uh, uh, development some really nice apartments in there and a lot of uh, very good space. It's all pedestrianized with uh, water features and uh, good spaces to sit out there when the weather is appropriate. Um, so this was a, a modern development uh, which was able to take place on uh, land which had been freed from any other buildings uh, by uh, the uh, bombing that took place. And in the same uh, areas, they built also a lot of office buildings uh, like this, uh, which were not very elegant and actually not very efficient. And a lot of those have now been demolished uh, some 40 years later. Uh, one of the big problems of the mall is that the uh, floor to ceiling height of the buildings isn't big enough to take air conditioning and all the services that a lot of the bankers working in the city require. And so uh, another big change which happened in uh, uh, 
the City of London and had a big impact on the sorts of buildings which were put up was the deregulation of the banking system. Now, the City of London had long been a global trading area, uh, used to trade with ships, uh, and uh, then, of course, it started trading digitally back in the 1980s. And uh, with the coming of digital communications, uh, we had an influx in London of American banks, Japanese banks, uh, and uh, many of the buildings had to be replaced, largely, as I say, because they needed uh, the right floor-to-ceiling heights in order to contain the servicing. And so uh, we had a number of developments, like this is a development called Broadgate, where uh, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, SOM, American Practice, uh, delivered this building uh, with public spaces for workers, uh, events in these public spaces. And that was, that was actually quite a new thing to be doing uh, back in, 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 that was sort of 1985 uh, that that was uh, first uh, built. And those public spaces uh, became very popular and remain very popular today. Uh, this is uh, uh, fairly common when, the, when it's not raining a fairly common uh, view of what happens at uh, six or seven o'clock in the evening when people stop work. So it becomes a place where people actually go to the office and work, but they also come and use the space uh, for meeting up with uh, friends and for networking. And then at the same time as the city of London being right in the center was developing as a financial, uh, it's, it's financial buildings, because it was a historic area, it was very difficult for them to build uh, the large floor plate buildings that uh, were needed by a lot of the American banks. Because, and, and the reason why they couldn't build that was because, as I say, said before, the city of London was essentially uh, still using a medieval uh, ground plan uh, which had uh, been the same before the fire of London, hadn't changed during the fire of London, hadn't really changed after the bombing by the Germans. So these uh, big, big floor plate buildings here, uh, which were needed by American banks, moved to um, our uh, new financial district, uh, which is called uh, Canary Wharf. And... Uh, with uh, actually quite a lot of uh, Saudi investment in uh, delivering uh, Canary Wharf, uh, that is now a very successful financial center just outside the uh, central area of the city. And then another thing happened, which was very important in the way that uh, uh, the city developed, was that the, um, uh, we had uh, the IRA, which was an Irish revolutionary army, uh, was attacking uh, uh, Britain. We had quite a lot of bomb attacks. And then there were two major bombs which went off in the central uh, business district. And uh, this was one of them in uh, 1993. And uh, luckily, uh, only one person was killed, but it demolished and damaged uh, a lot of buildings. And that, again, permitted more change to happen. And some of the changes had a positive effect, actually, because uh, this is, they created what they, they called a, a ring of steel around the area in terms of security, uh, created security, which uh, stopped a number of cars going in. So actually, uh, there was greater focus on public space, more people walking, and also, uh, that uh, the area that was bombed actually released land again uh, for the development of taller buildings uh, within the city of London. And this was, this was the first one uh, that was built, and it was built for the uh, Swiss Reinsurance Company. Um, it's nicknamed the Gherkin, and it was designed by uh, Norman Foster. And this really uh, was responsible for changing attitudes to tall buildings in London because it's a very ele elegant design, uh, but uh, 
uh, was something that people really liked and uh, was much more popular than some of the more brutalist uh, buildings that had been built before. And uh, so that building was completed just uh, uh, in 2004, so not very long ago. And then following that, there was a, a whole spate of uh, more uh, tall buildings proposed around London. And the skyline of London started to change quite dramatically. And at uh, New London Architecture, we do a study every year about how many towers are actually proposed. Um, we call a tall building over 20 stories, which is quite low for, uh, in comparison to uh, many countries, but it is high compared to the relatively low rise of most uh, buildings in London. And uh, so when we first did our survey, which was about 10 years ago, uh, there were about 250 towers uh, which are proposed for London. And uh, the, when we did the report last year, there were just over 500. So a growing number of tall buildings, things that you can see from the skyline, uh, see around the city. And uh, so we had to think, you know, how do you actually control both the location and the impact that these buildings have on the historic city? So this is the first way that uh, the height of buildings uh, which are around St. Paul's uh, are organized. And so you have uh, these height restrictions, the, these areas that uh, are coming over the city here, these are height restrictions. So no buildings can be so high that they puncture, they come through uh, this uh, virtual uh, uh, ceiling of uh, height of buildings around it. And uh, a few years ago, Jean Nouvel, the French architect, uh, built a retail center just uh, somewhere around here. And he angled all the uh, walls and the roofs so that they, just, they would just come millimeters under uh, the restrictions on, on height here and uh, on, on height around here. And uh, that he called the stealth building, rather like uh, the American stealth bomber. It was shaped a little bit like that, but also it was uh, just finding its way underneath the, 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 the radar line. So uh, these uh, cones of uh, protection then spread out further into the city. So the St. Paul's Dome is here. Here is the Houses of Parliament. And you have views which come from particular places, some miles away. There's, there's one down here, which is that's 13, uh, well, it's about 20 kilometers away, I suppose. Uh, this is uh, uh, about six kilometers away. And these are hills and parks. So any view from here ha is protected. So you can't build any tall buildings in these areas. You can't build tall buildings here or here or here or here. And so uh, those views are what we call protected views. And uh, so that does mean that you always are able from those places to have a good view of St. Paul's Cathedral, which as I say, remains a very iconic um, uh, view for Londoners and uh, is uh, people feel very strongly about having any development which might impact on it. And I'll uh, show with this building just how that sort of con control works. This is uh, called the Leadenhall building or it has a uh, nickname called the cheese grater because it, it's shaped a bit like a, a, a cheese grater you might use in the kitchen and this is designed by uh, Richard Rogers, or Rogers Sturk Harbour is the full name of the practice. And uh, as you can see, it obviously is much uh, wider at the base and it gets a very slim, very uh, small uh, office space, dining space up at the top. And this is a sketch by uh, the designers at the beginning, but uh, uh, the, they were 
the option of uh, uh, building a rectangular building, uh, but that would have been constrained uh, because uh, beyond the building would be the view of uh, St. Paul's Cathedral Dome. And uh, there's a protected view uh, which they respected. And this is, this is how uh, it works. So the, the view um, from uh, the west, you're looking towards the dome. And if this was a vertical wall, it would really affect your uh, view of uh, St. Uh, Paul's uh, from uh, the, the viewpoint. But by leaning the building away from it, it uh, doesn't impact it in quite the same way. So other aspects of supporting the historic aspects of uh, London, some of it is around the idea of improving public space in front of buildings. Uh, this is our uh, National Gallery, which is in uh, Trafalgar Square, our main public space. And uh, th this area along here was a, uh, that was just a busy road up until about uh, 15 years ago. And so it, it was then, this was created into one single public space, increased communication and easier access uh, from here to uh, the main area there. And uh, that created a much better setting uh, for the historic building. We've also been doing a lot to uh, change the, the character of streets, particularly in these sorts of areas where you have uh, narrow alleyways. And the city of London has a lot of narrow alleyways like this because of its uh, historic uh, uh, plan, the medieval plan. And so instead of being uh, just uh, normal road surfaces, uh, the, uh, the sidewalks, the pavements have, have been changed. So there's no, no step here. It's much easier to walk in the street, walk across the streets. And the general impression is that this is designed more for pedestrians than it is uh, for cars. So it become, these become pedestrian precincts. And also, at, at the moment, one of the things that we're building in the River of Thames, in the River Thames, is a, a, a new uh, drainage system. A huge tunnel is being dug underneath the river uh, to remove all the sewage. And uh, each uh, stage where pumps are, are being put in, they, they, they under, underneath, uh, they have to put in uh, uh, new pipes and so on. And on top of that, uh, then we're creating uh, new public spaces, uh, small parks and places where people can uh, sit out and enjoy the river rather than closing them off as one normally would do uh, with engineering works. A lot is being done to improve the uh, pedestrian experience. Um, there's a walkway all along the River Thames and uh, this bridge was uh, created quite recently just to improve the access uh, from the bridge down to uh, the riverside walk. And uh, these riverside walks, the, they, these were the ancient uh, docks uh, where uh, trading used to take place. Other areas where we're looking to uh, just uh, make better spaces around historic buildings. Uh, this uh, is a, a very early marketplace on the left is the Bank of England, very important building. And uh, this at the moment uh, is a really very nasty junction. And so the idea is about how do you actually make that into a better uh, pedestrian and enjoyable space. And uh, this is uh, one uh, solution of taking out all the cars and uh, uh, allowing people to walk across it or uh, bicycle across it. And uh, now uh, that's been worked up much more to create a scheme which is now going ahead uh, where uh, you create again these uh, pedestrian spaces, a lot of uh, greenery around it. Uh, we, like so many cities around the world, now have a big policy of uh, putting in more and more trees to create a greener, healthier uh, city and to uh, uh, absorb some of the carbon we're 
putting out into the atmosphere. And this is just another view of uh, uh, some of the uh, you know, really important buildings around it, uh, but creating a much better context uh, for those to sit within. And that uh, is not just around historic buildings too, but uh, uh, this is the base of the uh, Leadenhall building, the cheese grater I showed earlier. And this is the improvement of public space taking place uh, where five or six years ago, these were just uh, empty spaces and now are both planted and made attractive places for people to uh, sit in. And this is a proposed new building. It, they haven't started on site for it yet, but again, this is raised up off the ground. So this is all public space underneath and uh, uh, walkways are then created through this to create a, a fully public space at the base of the building, uh, but also there will be public space at the top of the building so that these are available to uh, the general public to uh, use and uh, to be fully accessible uh, all, all the time. These are more, more streets, uh, use of the historic narrow streets now turned into uh, really uh, traffic free uh, pedestrian zones. And that London, one of its uh, great benefits in London is, are the green squares we have uh, built, a lot of them during the uh, 18th, 19th century, uh, but they have a lot of uh, mature trees and uh, uh, good landscaping. And so there's a lot of work going on at the moment to just improve the quality of those spaces, both in terms of the, uh, their greenery, uh, but also how people can use them uh, when they need to uh, sit out, have a sandwich, or uh, meet up with friends and uh, network in, in, in the city. And quite a lot of these spaces now, is, it's not just a matter of uh, putting in uh, new uh, planting and trees, but also uh, this is a sustainable urban drainage um, uh, installation, which is really very important in England because we get quite a lot of rain and uh, at the moment uh, the, because of global warming there's an increased amount of flash flooding uh, so we have to uh, alleviate that by putting in sustainable urban drainage which attenuates the water so that it doesn't uh, overflow into the main drainage uh, that uh, uh, feeds all the houses and the rest of the city. So sustainable urban drainage, a uh, very important part of uh, uh, these new installations. And so I just pressed the wrong button. That's it. And that all sits within our whole program towards creating a, a, a greener city. And uh, London, uh, its overall plan is actually set within uh, this is the Greater London area again, but around the city we have a, a green belt uh, where development, it's very difficult to actually carry out development in those areas. It is possible, but very, very difficult. But it means we, are, uh, we have a space around the city, which is for uh, leisure and uh, for somewhere that, where the character of the areas are protected, um, but also it's seen as a, a green lung for uh, people who live in the city. And uh, greenery is, and it sits around a lot of areas of inside, inside the Greater London area. So you have, uh, uh, we have about 58% uh, of uh, uh, the area is green. And uh, so you can see that on this map. Now within that context, we have to look at how do we actually develop uh, new areas and develop the sort of housing we have to have in the city. We have to build somewhere around 90,000 new homes every year in London to keep up with population growth. And a lot of that development takes place on what, is, what are called opportunity areas. And these, these mark opportunity areas. And those are largely places which were industrial spaces before or old infrastructure. And so it's sort of secondhand land. And uh, 
areas like uh, this is the Olympic Park, which was built within an opportunity area. And uh, this is the uh, cycling stadium and the main stadium there. And so it is now being developed with new housing around it, a uh, new cultural center and uh, places where you can actually build new development without actually impacting on uh, the historic or the existing uh, buildings in the city. This is uh, another opportunity area. It's called Nine Elms. Uh, this is the American Embassy uh, there. Uh, again, the river and uh, 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 an old power station there, which has been, uh, is being refurbished to make the offices of uh, Apple and uh, a whole lot of residential development here. And this was a, an old industrial site with uh, low sheds, uh, which is now being uh, redeveloped. And for individual buildings as well, uh, now because of zero carbon, uh, the aim is that we uh, retrofit more buildings rather than actually uh, rebuilding them. And uh, this is an office building. This is not a very old building. This was built in the 1980s, but needs to be upgraded. And so this is what it looked like a few years ago. And uh, this is uh, now what it's been redeveloped as. And the interesting thing about that is that the only new piece are the three floors on the top. All the structure has been reused to uh, build that building. So this is a retrofit building, not a, a totally new building, which uh, saves uh, a, a lot of uh, carbon. Uh, the embedded carbon is saved and makes it a much more efficient uh, building. And then in the, in, in the background, uh, the, uh, is what is called the city cluster. And these are a cluster of towers which have uh, been built over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and they've been built in that location because that is the area of the city which sits outside those cones, those protected cones that I showed you earlier. And then a lot of uh, work which is being done on individual buildings uh, are where individual buildings are being changed, but their historical elements are still retained, but they're made uh, fit for purpose for uh, contemporary use. And this is a part of the uh, Royal Opera House. Uh, and the interiors were changed and modernized and made to work much better and provide new facilities for theatres. Um, then we have the, the Royal Academy, which has been uh, improved uh, by the architect David Chipperfield, uh, a, a new uh, connection, uh, something which is a, a very contemporary installation there, a very uh, uh, clean concrete uh, uh, bridge which goes through the building, uh, which sits comfortably with the historic architecture. And this is the interior looking through uh, where he's created this corridor, uh, utilizing uh, the uh, ancient vaults that are there, but uh, creating a very modern feel to it. And this is in the uh, V&A Museum. Uh, Amanda Levite was the architect where uh, you have the historic uh, building around here of the Victoria and Albert Museum and inserted into this courtyard, under this courtyard, uh, there is a large new uh, contemporary gallery and uh, with these uh, extensions here to uh, take people down into uh, the new uh, structure. So uh, here you have the entrance courtyard and then uh, the older buildings around here and then dug underneath the historic building are uh, new facilities for the museum but also here then this new uh, very spectacular gallery, uh, which fits into the historic uh, buildings around it. And this is one of our uh, older railway stations, uh, King's Cross, and uh, that also needed to be upgraded to make it uh, fit for purpose. 
And uh, so this uh, extension by John McCaslin uh, was uh, designed, which creates a new public plaza, which extends the uh, building uh, so that it makes it easier to move people around the area. And uh, this is a new uh, shopping area, which has been uh, made from uh, these old archways, which used to be for industrial use and for an old railway line which came through here. Uh, the brick buildings have all been retained and restored. And then this new roof uh, designed by uh, Thomas Heatherwick has been uh, built over it, which has retail space built within it, but uh, it creates a, a very different uh, image of the building than the historic one, but nevertheless is built in a way which uh, uh, sits comfortably uh, with the historic architecture. And then behind as well, you have these old uh, gas holders, uh, which used to uh, be for gas uh, drums of gas, which went up and down. Uh, they were redundant, and, uh, but they were protected. And we, we, we have three ways that uh, you protect buildings in the UK. Grade one is where you can't do anything at all and grade two is where you can do um, uh, some works, but you have to be very careful. And then we have conservation areas, uh, which uh, uh, protect quite a lot of the historic features of uh, wider, wider areas. And uh, so the, the, these are, I might say, grade two buildings where good architects have actually created uh, very good additions to existing and historic buildings. And that's looking up into uh, the roof of the... Uh... And then this is a building which is being uh, worked on at the moment. This is a new Museum of London. Uh, these are historic market buildings uh, which are now being converted into the museum. Most of the structure is being uh, maintained, uh, but new entrances, new circulation and uh, an existing dome is being created into a major feature of the building. But the, the historic uh, uh, structures will uh, remain, but it will become a very efficient and a very elegant uh, space to use. And even where we have new spaces like this, this is within uh, a, a, a very new office uh, block uh, complex uh, where they've maintained uh, some uh, ruins here, uh, built a new bridge over the top, but actually created uh, very nice landscaping here where people uh, can sit out and enjoy the city. And then I'll just talk a little bit about residential, how we're approaching residential design at the moment. And this is, uh, I'd say, a historic view of... Uh, this is a typical London house of the... Uh, uh, 18th, 19th century, and London is made up of a lot of streets like this, brick-built houses uh, in terraces. And so uh, architects today are reinterpreting those to uh, be suitable for uh, modern living. And this is a modern example of a terrace building with uh, brick, but also with very much the same architectural feel as the historic ones. Brick is now a very common uh, building material. We used to be going much more towards concrete, uh, but the more tr sort of traditional view of uh, brick as a traditional material now is uh, pretty well ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And here, even with larger buildings, uh, brick is uh, being used. And this uh, typology, uh, which we call mansion blocks, became a very common uh, method of building and delivering apartments back in the 19th century. And those are being uh, recreated with more uh, contemporary architecture, but ne nevertheless using traditional materials and uh, traditional forms. And even for lower buildings, again, uh, brick is a common material being used, and these uh, uh, pitched roofs and so on are uh, part of that uh, 
uh, again, a traditional look to the housing so that they uh, fit in and are in context and within the character of uh, existing more historic architecture. I don't know why it's doing that, so that's it. And here we are, the River Thames again. And uh, this uh, next image shows the sort of changes that have been taken place. This was an image taken in 2006. And uh, then this is, uh, these are the buildings. Not all of them are completed, but this is uh, the number of buildings which are now uh, underway or have planning permission and will be completed in the next few years. So uh, London has seen quite a lot of changes, but as I say, those uh, towers generally are designed to protect very specific views and uh, this is the view of the river if you remember the view of the uh, uh, the river we saw before with uh, the dome of St Paul's being very prominent uh, even now with all these towers the towers are restricted into this particular zone protected zone and so the view of uh, St. Paul's Dome here is always protected and uh, remains visible from uh, many of the points around London uh, that uh, people want to see it from. So uh, protection of views is a key part of how we maintain that sort of those historic elements of the city. Uh, but as you can see, we're able to deliver a uh, new contemporary workspace that the offices of today require. Thank you very much. So happy to answer any questions. Mm. Thank you so much for uh, such an informative talk. Uh, I personally enjoyed it a lot and uh, I'm sure that a lot of us enjoyed it the same way or more. And uh, it's, a, it's really amazing to see how uh, the restoration and preservation of historic buildings can actually add to the sense of identity and sense of attachment to the city and can actually strengthen and enforce people's feelings about their city. As well as, uh, it's remarkable to see how different factors affected uh, shaping and forming architecture throughout time. And uh, the last thing that which I really enjoyed, how London is focusing a lot on the idea of uh, public open space and greening and, and uh, landscaping to enforce sustainability and also to contribute positively to the future and uh, creating an environmentally friendly kind of structures and uh, built environment. So um, uh, thank you so much for this. And uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the Design and Architecture Commission for such a great opportunity, especially uh, Dr. Samaya, of course, and Ms. Saiba. I would like to open the floor for questions. If anyone uh, has comments or questions, Okay, and first I would like to thank you for this great presentation. It's awesome. Um, but I would like to uh, emphasize the material that uh, uh, major buildings have, uh, have, sorry, has in the uh, in London city. So what's the main uh, criteria to pick a material for the, the new buildings or uh, ones that are in, inside the restrict, restricted areas? Well, I mean, that, that, that's a very interesting question because that, uh, the criteria changes at different times. Now, uh, what you see is um, criteria where height the, the, there is no planning control on height. A lot of cities will say you can't build higher than you know, five stories or 20 stories. But uh, the, 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 the maximum height in London has been controlled by aeroplanes because we have Heathrow uh, Airport and uh, planes go over it. And there's another airport to the east of the city. And so the um, uh, airline uh, people who control the way the planes come into land, uh, they actually say you can't build it more than a thousand feet, uh, 300 meters is maximum you can do. So that's not a, that's a sort of regulation. It's not a 
not a planning constraint. So nobody said, we want them this height. It was just uh, to protect them. Now, um, uh, our new mayor, uh, Sadiq Khan, has actually created a, a, a new regulation which will take place, will have an impact. Where in 10 years' time, you'll see the impact of that. And uh, uh, we're, we're changing our system into slightly more similar to American zoning, that uh, the planners will have to say, we can, we can build buildings to this height, a fixed height. Um, we have to uh, design, uh, give developers uh, some constraints as to how they build next to lower buildings. So, uh, so what you have to do is to actually build, might say, the volume that, as a planner, you will permit. And that gives you a volume within which developers are able to uh, build their buildings. So, uh, so this is this is a new uh, aspect which is only only just now really beginning to have an impact. And as I say, it's a bit like the American system. And the interesting thing that uh, Canary Wharf, which I showed a picture of, which was designed in 1985, although it was built in London, it was designed very much uh, with an American viewpoint. And so. Skidmoreings and Merrill, who did the designs, they built, they designed the whole shape of all the buildings that would uh, go on. And you can see a drawing from 1985, and you compare it to how they built it today, it's the same shape. The architecture is a bit different, but the, the basic form of the, of the plan is very different. Up until now, uh, the developers have had much more uh, flexibility in what heights and uh, shapes they would do. Now uh, we're going to just control it a, a, a bit more. So I, I'm, I'm, it's, it, oh, that's better. You see that the sun is taking more than the American approach when it comes to urban planning. Does that mean that uh, there are going to be more buildings that are placed closer together rather than far apart? Like uh, in Canary Wharf, a lot of buildings are next to each other and they all serve the same purpose. They're all corporate buildings. Do you expect more buildings to pop up in the center of London that do the same? Like, there, I know there are some in the center of London, but in other districts. So you, you just have to say it again. There's a, 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 quite a lot of um, noise from the... Uh... Uh, radio breaks the um, do you think, since London is taking a more American approach, that the American approach is going to be very Yes, can you... She's saying since London is taking an American approach in urban planning. Right. Uh, do you think it will change in the future? Is this... Did I hear it correctly? That's good. Yes, great. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to ask, since I'm just taking more of the American approach in urban planning, um, do you think this means that a lot of buildings would be placed closer together rather than far apart? Because only a few uh, parts of the London area have a lot of buildings that serve uh, a singular purpose together. Like, um, there's the area with the gherkin and the, the long one. Um, do you expect to see more of those cluster of buildings all throughout London with the new planning regulations, or is that... You mean the higher yes. Higher. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Uh, all right. Okay. Um, I think in 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 areas like the, the the city of London, you will see more, and they're very tight. I mean, some of them are really really close. I mean, maybe uh, you know, thirty meters, uh, maybe even less than that, twenty meters uh, between uh, really tall buildings, and uh, uh, and. That's a, the idea is there is to concentrate these uh, major international users in one place because uh, it, it, there is a, they want to keep it a pedestrian space so people can move easily between the buildings. Uh, they like the density. Uh, there is an understanding that uh, what they call agglomeration, that if you have, you have, you have a, a lot of people t in uh, one place, it's more efficient 
economically, they're more productive, they waste less time traveling between buildings. There's, there, there are huge efficiencies in, in very dense cities like that. And to a certain extent, uh, quite a lot of the thinking in London uh, about density uh, it, uh, has been based on a comparison between Los Angeles at one side and Hong Kong at the other. And Hong Kong, as a, as, as a very dense city, uh, also has lower CO2 emissions, uh, but it also has a very efficient uh, central business district. So the, the, the city of London as the central business district does actually, uh, you, they, they like the idea of bringing people together quite tightly. If, if you move further out into more suburban areas, then people uh, are much more negative about taller buildings, uh, that local communities uh, are more resistant to them. But uh, I think that there is a, a, a positive planning case for, again, uh, what is um, talked about in the States is transit-oriented development, where you create denser uh, developments around when you have good uh, public transport communications. And uh, I th we, we are seeing more of that, and I think we will continue to see more um, dense, even suburban centers will have uh, tall buildings uh, so that you can go from your apartment down into the uh, underground system and into, into work very easily. Whereas as you get outside the centers, then we're going to see uh, the same sort of lower heights that uh, are more traditional. London is uh, very much um, an underground railway oriented. How, in the, ne in the next 10 years, how do you think the planning will affect the underground system in London? Will the people be more or less dependent? Yeah, that's, that's a, another really interesting question and, and, and quite a complicated question because actually one of the things we don't quite know is how COVID is going to impact on people's desire to use public transport. At the moment, there is a sort of negativity about it because uh, uh, underground systems are seen as slightly unhealthy. Um, maybe people will forget that. Um, uh, we, we have other more complex um, political issues in that uh, public transport needs investment from the government and the government uh, wants to invest in the north of England because that's the poorer part of the country and not in London, which is they see as the rich part of the country. So, uh, and we need continual investment if we're gonna have a really efficient uh, transport system. So th there are some unknowns at the moment as to quite what will happen over the next 10 years. Um, but uh, the interesting thing that happened uh, during COVID and will continue to happen is because with people working from home, then instead of going into the center, going to an office and shopping there and having restaurants, they went to the restaurants and they went to the shops in the local area or they went on Amazon. But uh, uh, there was so uh, sort of suburban areas became very, those centers became very successful. And actually the central areas, the West End of London, City of London, uh, were really damaged uh, economically very badly by uh, COVID. It's, you know, it's beginning to come back, but uh, again, we, we just wait to see um, how people are going to work. If are people going to work uh, you know, one more day at, at home than they did before, or will they all go back to the office? Will companies insist people go back to the office? Um, these are sort of unknowns, and uh, which I, I, I think makes it very exciting for architects and planners to know because we have this whole uh, new series of issues that we have to deal with in terms of how we plan cities. On the one side, you've got uh, the sort of post-COVID, and you've also got the impact of net zero and uh, climate change. And so the, the challenges to the built environment professionals are just amazing at the moment. They're huge opportunities, but they're also uh, lots of uncertainties. Uh, 
Thank you very much for um, this extremely informative talk. Now, um, a phrase stuck with me um, from years ago, which was the burden of history. And obviously, London is a historical city. And I wanted to take this opportunity, perhaps, to hear your views on some sort of a contrast between what we see in London, where you have the layering of history, and then you also have a lot of private interest and perhaps architecture that does not necessarily always kind of contextualize with the areas that are there, with, let's say, what is happening currently in Saudi Arabia, where there's always this talk about, you know, identity, the urban space. So there's a lot of, let's say, um, a drive to unify, to uh, create some sort of a, a system of order, perhaps, and also having that context of the history being extremely um, significant, I think, in the way that we drive uh, architectural and urban developments. So I wanted to hear a few, I mean, comparing perhaps, you know, um, uh, the little uh, that you've seen of uh, Riyadh and also of London and, uh, you know, where our chaos should be in relation to, you know, how forward looking, how can you incorporate that, and also just, uh, you know, just the uh, agenda reflection, I think, would be quite useful. Because I think the, the area's priority whenever we have discussions about such developments is extremely different um, in different parts of the world. I think so. That, that's why I was struck by your comment the other night about uh, what I saw as traditional architecture, you didn't see as traditional architecture. And to a certain extent, uh, a lot of people building houses here today using Greek and Roman imagery, to them that's very modern, whereas to us that, that's really old. And I think that uh, clearly there is, there is in, in, in Britain a very strong debate between uh, might say the traditionalist and the modernist, and uh, that was uh, uh, Prince Charles has been uh, leading uh, a lot of the thinking about uh, sort of older architectural styles, but also interestingly enough, leading the discussion around walkable cities and uh, better landscaping, better streets, and uh, that that side of things, which, which is that everyone, even modernists, agree with that. So everyone can agree. I think about the space between the buildings, uh, you know, more green, more space, uh, better places to uh, uh, people, well-being being a very important part of how we see cities at the moment. But how, how, how you design buildings now is fascinating because the, the, the idea of a real clash between modernists and traditionists has, has changed. Um, when uh, I, I, I was there, uh, when Prince Charles made his first speech uh, in 1984, where he, he, he talked about um, uh, a building in Trafalgar Square, with that picture I saw of Trafalgar Square, he, he, he talked about uh, uh, it as being a carbuncle on the face of an old friend. And a carbuncle is a, like a, a nasty spot uh, that uh, uh, people don't like to have. And uh, so this um, uh, was... was something where he really hated the modern architecture. And then there was a long debate between people like Norman Foster and uh, uh, Prince Charles, Richard Rogers, Prince Charles the modernist against the younger architects now have a much more considered uh, view, I think, somewhere in, in the middle. And it, it's very interesting. If you look at uh, what I was showing you, all those uh, brick uh, housing buildings, which have changed totally. And uh, uh, Boris Johnson, now our prime minister for a bit, um, but he was mayor of London. And he wanted the streets to go back to what they looked like in the 18th century. He, he's a traditionist like Prince Charles, and he saw uh, that we should be building older streets. But uh, once, uh, once they'd studied it and they looked at all the planning regulations, fire safety, uh, construction, costs, all the changes that need to take place, you ended up with those buildings which are quite traditional but not totally traditional. Uh, and we call that the New London vernacular. So it's sort of vernacular architecture, local architecture, but it is um, modern to look at, but it has all the, it has the proportions, uh, has the materials, and it has some of the detailing of more traditional architecture. And that is something that uh, 
most people sort of find acceptable. It's a, it's it might be a bit middle of the road, uh, and certainly um, people like Zaha Hadid would just hate it. It's so boring, she'd say. That's really boring. She wants, and uh, you know, you've got a nice new station being made by her. That's certainly not traditional. Um, uh, and I think there is always a place for uh, a, a exceptional modern architecture and exceptional things that don't fit in with the normal. Uh, but uh, you know, I think what what we're delivering through those brick buildings now in London is a is a sort of background uh, of 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 housing. And then every now and then you can have your exceptional buildings. Sometimes they're traditional, sometimes they're outstandingly modern. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, thank you. Pleasure. Very interesting presentation. Oh, thank you. Recognition. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maybe we can have a group picture together. We need some false cathedral with a, a clear view. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. It was such a pleasure having you here with us today. Yeah, it's been. A, I've had a really good time in the city, and uh, I was sort of had to put my mask on, so I didn't know where I put it. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, it, it, yes. Thank you.